Today uh, we are going to work on problem 41 and 42, which is dealing with the Moore circle. Um, I will review a few of the definitions that we had in the past, and also uh, we will learn about the pore pressure. We learned about different type of stresses or the terms that we use. One was the mean stress. Indeed, it's the average stress of sigma 1, 2, and 3. And the other one, it was deviatoric stress. And indeed, deviatoric stress um, indeed is the total stress. Or as an example, it can be a sigma 1 minus uh, mean stress. Um, indeed, the total stress, okay, um, has two component. One is the isotropic component that we know as a mean stress. And the second component is anisotropic component that we know as a deviatoric stress. Uh, these two elements or these two components, they are responsible each for doing some specific deformation in the rock. And, um, I would give you an example, for instance, isotropic component can cause the volume loss in the rock. Or the uh, deviatoric stress indeed will cause a shear shearing in the rock or, you know, anisotropic uh, deformation in the rock. Uh, we learned about, about these two stresses in the past um, and today we are going to learn about the effective stress and indeed um, effective stress is equal to total stress minus pore pressure. Um, a total stress can be sigma 1, can be sigma 2, and sigma 3. So effective stress is equal to sigma 1 minus pore pressure. Or effective sigma 2 is equal to sigma 2 minus pore pressure. So what is pore pressure is indeed? Um, let's assume that you have you have a sample that there is no uh, uh, fracture in it or there is no uh, you know permeability in it and therefore there is no chance having liquids inside the volume of the rock. But this is not the case everywhere, right? For instance, if you have one solid metamorphic rock, there is no um, you know empty uh, gaps between grains or there is no fracture in it. So in that case, uh, the pore pressure inside of that rock, it's going to be zero. But it's not the case. When we are dealing with the fractured rocks or sedimentary rocks like uh, sediment, like let's say sandstone with 20% of uh, porosity, uh, in that case, the space between these grains most likely will fill by the liquid, either by water or if we are dealing with the reservoir rocks, it's going to be filled by the uh, by the oil. So uh, what this liquid does, indeed, it's gonna it's gonna lubricate the grains, and therefore the grains or the you know the uh, let's say if it's along the fracture, we can call it as a fault plane. The two blocks can easily move, right, with respect to each other. And indeed, pore pressure or existence of the liquid inside the rock, it's going to reduce the, um, uh, the cohesive strength of the rock, and the rock can break under smaller uh, stress. So therefore, uh, we are using the term effective, right? So effective stress, indeed, is the total stress minus pore pressure. Um, in, in the next slide, I'm going to show you how you can um, show the effect of pore pressure in the Moore circle. Um, in this slide, uh, there are some uh, um, um, terms that we went through it before, but I'm going to review it again here. The x-axis indeed is the normal stress, we show it with sigma n. The y-axis is shear stress, and we show it with tau or sigma s. And we know the, the circle, the Moore circle itself, it shows the entire stress state in the rock in different directions. And um, normally, uh, we show the failure plane, you know, as one of, you know, as a radius of this circle. 
and indeed where these radius um, reaches to the primitive circle, you can actually project that point to the x-axis and read the normal stress along that fault plane and, and also read the shear stress and that value indeed is showing the amount of shear stress on the fault plane that is shown here. Uh, we know the center of the circle indeed is equal to sigma 1 plus sigma 3 divided by 2 and the radius is sigma 1 minus sigma 3 divided by 2. Um, let's say uh, there is poor pressure in the rock and it's going to lubricate you know, the friction between the grains and it's going to reduce the cohesive stress and, and also it's going to reduce the amount of um, you know, normal stresses that they are affecting to the uh, on rock um, and therefore um, the poor pressure indeed pushes the more circles towards the origin. Let's say for instance here let's say the center of the more circle is at 5 megapascal and we have 1 megapascal of poor pressure. What it does indeed it's going to push the center of the circle from 5 megapascal into 4 megapascal and the new value of the sigma 1 and sigma 3 it can be called effective sigma 1 effective sigma 3 and we show it with a star um, star on it like sigma star 3 sigma star 1 so as you see here poor pressure it uses all normal stresses but um, as you see, it's just you know changing the location of the uh, circle, but it doesn't change the size of the uh, Mohr circle. So in that case, as you see here, in, in, in these two circles, if you take one particular location like that on both, which is one here and the other point, let's say it's here, it's the exact point, both of them, should have the same sigma s, right? So uh, from this, you can remember poor pressure only affects on the normal fault. There is no effect on the shear stress due to the poor pressure. Um, I think in the next uh, slide, yeah, we are going to work on problem 41. And here you can actually understand exactly how the poor pressure and be taken into our um, calculation. So in this figure, okay, we have the uh, failure envelope of of the sandstone, right? And um, and the sandstone is a petroleum uh, reservoir rock, and we know in the area the sigma one is 72 megapascal and sigma three it's 42 megapascal, and the question is asking how much pore pressure is needed to fracture the uh, reservoir rock. So I would, uh, before getting into it, let me I help you to understand indeed what is the fracking uh, and how it works. Indeed, uh, if you inject the water into the rock and by doing this, you are indeed going to lubricate uh, you know, the grains and you are affecting on the normal stress and normal stress um, which which helps to strengthen the rock it's going to be weakened and the rock can can break very easily so um, in this example what we're going to do uh, we're going to plot our circle and we will try to move it towards the origin and see where the circle it's crossing the uh, failure envelope before going through it, uh, you know what is the failure envelope and how we can obtain it, right? If you remember from the last week, we had uh, an example that we we took it to the lab and we applied, um, you know, four different um, uh, stress fields on it, right? We have the axial stress and we had uh, confining stress and we increased confining stress and we come up with you know with four circles let me just show it here quickly just to remind you what we were uh, what i'm talking um, if you remember the other problem that we solved we had like um four um uh, s uh, tests on the rock 
and we came up with four different circles, right? Uh, and each time the confining stress and um, let's say uh, uh, and the axial stress, okay, increased and increased. And we said after this, what you can do, uh, you know, it's the same rock. We have four samples from the same rock, and we are applying different confining stress and axial stress to break the rock. And each time. Uh, for each example experiment, we're gonna come up with the one more circle and then you try to draw the tangent line to this, okay, the best one that goes through all of it. And indeed, this line, it's gonna show the failure envelope um, of this specific rock. Uh, you can actually do in both sides, right? And as you see here, and if, if you're interested how we get with, to this, Indeed, uh, what we do uh, for these four examples, we apply the compressional forces. You can ap apply the, the tensile force in one side, right? You can actually uh, try to uh, tear the rock, right, by, by, by tensile force. In that case, sigma 1, it's going to be 0. Um, let me draw it again. The sigma 1, it's going to be 0 and sigma 3 it's going to be negative right if the rock breaks under this sigma 1 and this sigma 1 which is 0 and sigma 3 which is negative let's say 1 megapascal in that case you can actually try to complete this uh, failure envelope as I'm showing here so here you know how they come up with this uh, failure envelope and what you're going to do it's pretty easy. So first, I will plot the sigma 1 and sigma 3. Sigma 1, it's 72 megapascal. Let's place that one here, 72 um, megapascal, right? And this is sigma 1. And sigma 3, indeed, is 42. This is 42. Sigma 3, uh, 42 megapascal. And you know the center of the circle, it's sigma 1 plus sigma 3 divided by 2. If you do that calculation, you're going to end up with 57. So let me show uh, 57 first. This is 57. That has to be a center of, of the circle. And you use your compass and you draw the, um, um, uh, you draw the, uh, the circle. So let me I do it again. This is my 32. This is 42, this is 57, and I'm going to draw my circle. So you draw your circle as this, right? Um, and um, let me write again. This is my sigma 1 here, and this is sigma 3. I don't write the numbers because you see the numbers on the, on the graph. So the next step indeed um, is uh, we suppose to push this circle back towards the origin and find out where this circle is going to reach to this uh, failure envelope. As soon as this circle touches the, uh, you know, uh, the, the failure envelope, we're going to stop there and we can measure how much we move towards the origin. The easy way, indeed, you take a piece of vellum paper <clears throat> and place it on top and trace the same circle and the core and the uh, center and then move it towards towards the origin and I'm, I'm I don't have uh, you know uh, right tools to do it but I will try to do my best and let's say I'm going to um, yeah something like that maybe maybe I take it a little bit larger just to show you uh, uh, where you should stop Let's assume the size of the second circle that I draw here is the same as circle, the first circle. So what I, how I did that one, I took a piece of vellum paper, I placed on top, I traced the size of the circle and the center, and then I moved the vellum paper to the, uh, to the origin, and as soon as the circle reaches to the envelope, I will stop. Uh, you can easily read what is the center, uh, 
you can read the center of the circle, right? For instance, let's say it's about 18, and you know the radius of the circle, it's sigma 1 minus sigma 3 divided by 2. You can actually draw, you can take the vellum paper off, and you can draw the circle by knowing where it was the, the center, and, and also uh, you know the radius, and you can draw the circle. So doing that, uh, we need to know how much we moved. So you know this um, number, okay? It was 57 megapascal, and then you moved it to uh, to somewhere here. Let's say about 18, right? And uh, you can easily say, okay. Uh, 15, 8, uh, 57 minus 18, which is going to end up to 39 megapascal. And indeed, this is the answer for your question. So if I need to frack these reservoir rock, I need to pump okay, the water into the reservoir rock with a pressure of 39 megapascal. If I do so, I will help, you know, uh, moving you know more circle towards the origin and indeed the rock the, the rock or reservoir rock it's gonna you know weaken and we can easily frack it by just injecting the water into the into the reservoir so um, I'm gonna uh, stop here um, you have some time to complete this and then I will come back with problem 42